Welcome. This is Eric McCoy, a.k.a. McCoy, a.k.a. EMAC, from the University of California, Irvine, Department of Emergency Medicine. And this rapid-fire session is on raising the bar in healthcare simulation research. And this is complementary to the 90-minute workshop we did here at IMSH 2018 on implementing concepts of evidence-based medicine to build strong research protocols. Disclosure. So I am physically here right now at conference in room 402A, giving a lecture at this very moment. And so in the spirit of making the impossible possible, the theme of the conference, the only way I could be at two places at the same time was to record my presentation. And so that's how I'm accomplishing that goal. So thank you for understanding. And I really have no disclosures. So the objectives. So I want to share with you how we implemented concepts of evidence-based medicine to build strong simulation research protocols with the incorporation into our educational curriculum. And I also want to share an example of a simulation project we've done recently incorporating these concepts to yield study designs with strong methodologic underpinnings. And last but not least, I want to be at two places at the same time because I just happen to be double booked for this hour. So in our 90-minute workshop, we asked the question and answered the question, what is the purpose of research? And we found and we discovered that it's the search for truth. The purpose of research is the search for truth in the universe. There really is an answer out there whether or not drug A is better than drug B, or that simulation is better than problem-based learning for a specific question or even didactic lecture. So it's a process. And research is a process that both has a structure and a function. As anatomy and physiology, and we talked about the basic components of research and how it works. But essentially, research draws from multiple different disciplines, from epidemiology, clinical epidemiology, biostatistics, and evidence-based medicine. In incorporating all those disciplines, we found a way to look at research with regard to simulation almost exactly to say we look at clinical research or we design clinical research. But instead of having a drug or a surgical intervention as the therapy, our educational delivery methods are the therapy. And so the basics of the basic research components compose of the same things that we think about when we're designing clinical research. Our research question for a therapy trial, we're looking at the patients, the interventions, the comparisons, and the outcomes, the PICO mnemonic. In our case, our patients are our subjects, are our students. What intervention are we going to be studying? For simulation-based research, the intervention is actually an educational intervention. How about the comparison? What are we comparing this to? And last but not least, what are the specific outcomes we're looking at? The background and significance. For clinical research, the background and significance sets the clinical context for our clinical question. But for simulation research, it sets the educational context for our educational question. And knowing what type of study question we have, that's going to lend to us being more able to choose a specific study design to best and most appropriately answer our research question. What are our subjects? What are the characteristics of our subjects that we want to detail in order to ultimately generalize our findings to students in situations outside of our research setting? What variables are we going to look at? And last but not least, we discussed the statistical considerations. But with regard to the design, choosing the study design, we're not going to go into the entirety of study designs, but in general, studies fall into two categories, two broad categories. Descriptive and analytic. Descriptive studies simply describe and characterize and summarize a phenomenon of interest in a population. In this case, a phenomenon of interest would be, for instance, the affective domain of learning. What are the students' thoughts, feelings, and attitudes about simulation? And analytic studies attempt to quantify the relationship between at least two variables. They attempt to quantify the relationship between at least two variables. So for descriptive studies, things that lend itself to simulation research are things such as surveys or qualitative type of studies. And with regards to analytic studies, what falls into there is true experimental type of studies, experimental trials. But instead of a drug being the intervention, 
or a surgery being the intervention. In this case, it is a simulation education delivery method that's the intervention. And so, similar to clinical research, we look at populations as a complete set of individuals with a specified set of characteristics. And we want to draw from that population a sample and ultimately do observations or do experiments using these subjects. What are our experiments? Implementing new and novel educational delivery methods. And from these experiments and from these observations and conclusions, we want to make inferences about the general population, the larger group of students that we hope our educational delivery methods have an opportunity to impact. And what's an inference? An inference is a conclusion based off of evidence and reasoning. So we hope to draw inferences about the population based off of findings and conclusions in our study from the sample. And we're looking at variables, just like we would look at variables in a clinical trial. The independent variable or the predictor variable are those variables that we think have an impact or influence on a specific outcome. Which brings us to the dependent variable or outcome variable. In clinical research, these could be clinical outcomes, but in educational research, these are educational outcomes. So what specific outcomes are we looking at? Are we looking at test scores? Are we looking at proportion of students who pass a certain certified examination? Are we looking at performance? Actually, performance such as doing chest compressions with high fidelity that, that is high fidelity enough to meet the standards of high quality CPR with the American Heart Association guidelines. And we also discussed statistical considerations. So the same concepts that we're thinking about when we're doing clinical research, we think about that for our educational research. What type of data are we working with? What is our hypothesis? What sample size do we need to detect a specific difference between these groups on this educational outcome? And last but not least, we discussed the basic vocabulary that we need as educators to have a fruitful conversation with a biostatistician to help us design our study with regards to being able to test what it is that we're looking for. Because ultimately, the goal is to draw inferences from findings in our study about the phenomena of interest. And there are two major sets of inference involved in interpreting a study. Internal validity, which is the degree to which the investigator draws the correct conclusions about what actually happened in the study, and external validity, or generalizability, the degree for which we can draw conclusions of a study that we can appropriately use our conclusions and apply these conclusions to patients or students in situations outside the study design that we use to answer our question. Because the internal and external validity, our goal with that regard is to minimize bias or systematic error. The formal definition of bias is any process at any stage of inference that tends to yield results that systematically differ from the truth. So our goal is to minimize bias, to minimize the threats to the validity of the conclusions that we draw from our educational research. So with this in mind, what are we doing at UC Irvine? So at UC Irvine, we have a unique program in that we're implementing concepts of clinical epidemiology, biostatistics, and evidence-based medicine into the core content of our educational curriculum. So at the same time we're providing value and education to our learners, we're also quantitatively and qualitatively analyzing the effectiveness of our actions. A recent example of this is uh, a prospective randomized cross crossover study of telesimulation versus standard simulation for teaching medical students the management of critically ill patients. Again, we're implementing concepts of evidence-based medicine into our educational curriculum, so at the same time we're educating the students, we're also evaluating the effectiveness of our programs, of our educational delivery methods. And for those of us who aren't too familiar with what telesimulation is, it's a new and novel educational delivery method that leverages telecommunication resources and simulation resources for the education, training, and or assessment of learners at an off-site location. And what I mean by off-site location in this regard is a location that will preclude the effective training or education of your learners without the use of telecommunication resources. 
So what do we do? So we have our students and we randomize the students to either the standard group, the standard sim group, or the telesimulation group. And the standard simulation group is the standard simulation group. They're inside the simulation lab. They are physically in there making the decisions, touching the mannequin and doing the procedures on, on the high fidelity simulator. The telesimulation group is in a remote location watching the standard group real time do their scenario. And afterwards, we have a group debriefing. We have a group debriefing, and then there's the evaluation, there's the outcome component. But the debriefing is done as a group. So we're sharing our thoughts, we're sharing our feelings, we're sharing our attitudes, we're talking about the rationale behind why we did what we did, or why did you do what you did if you're in the telesimulation group. And then there's the formal evaluation, and this is the outcome that we're measuring, the knowledge content. So this falls under the, the, the learning domain of cognition. And then we cross them over. If you're in the standard sim group, now you're in the telesim group and vice versa. So again, the standard simulation group is actually physically in there with a mannequin like we would expect a standard high fidelity simulation scenario to be ran. The telesim group is watching real time the standard sim group make their decisions and see what's happening real time in a remote location. And then there's the group debriefing. And as we know, as simulation educators, debriefing is where all the magic happens. So the simulation formed that, that construct for which we're all going to have a shared experience. And in the debriefing, that's where we consolidate the knowledge gained. With regards to experiential learning, we have our concrete experience, the simulation. Then we have reflective observations where we're thinking about what we were thinking about during the simulation. Then there's something called abstract conceptualization conceptualization and that's where we bring to forth or to fruition the mental models and so the mental models or mental representations basically equate to the thought process of why the clinicians were thinking what they were thinking when they were doing what they were doing so the rationale behind the actions and the importance of bringing forth these mental models is that so the subject matter expert or the mentor can help the learner tweak their thought process they can consolidate what they already know was correct and they could tweak their framework or their perspective on what wasn't so correct in their thought process. And last but not least, there's something called active experimentation. So that now that we had this concrete experience, we had time to do some reflective observations and we had time to think about our mental representations in the presence of a subject matter expert or a, a mentor. Now we had time to mold our thought process. So the next time we have either a simulation encounter or an actual encounter with a patient, now we're better for it. Now we have more knowledge base and skill set to make better decisions at the next time we have an encounter with a similar type of question or similar type of problem. And so what do we find? We found that not only can you get qualitative data from implementing evidence-based medicine study designs and, and concepts into your educational curriculum, we can also quantitatively analyze how effective are we at our educational delivery methods and models. From a quantitative perspective, we found that essentially the telesimulation group did just as well as the simulation group with regards to the specific outcome measures that we measured. And also from a qualitative standpoint, that basically the students liked it. They said, hey, it would enhance the ability to provide care in the clinical setting. It deepened their insight into patient care. It provided an effective learning tool. Effectively, they enjoyed the scenario. So in sum, we found that implementing concepts of evidence-based medicine allowed us to qualitatively and quantitatively test and evaluate how effective we are at delivering our educational delivery methods, and two, we've acquired data to help us quantitatively and qualitatively analyze the effectiveness of our educational delivery methods. With specific regard to telesimulation, we've been able to take this evidence-based medicine concepts in our study designs and apply this and train healthcare providers all over the world using just an internet connection, our, our research our core content of the educational material in software programs that we study which are free or low cost. So how do you implement telesimulation at your institution? I'd love to tell you about it, but that's a whole different rapid fire session.
Thank you again for your time. This is Eric McCoy, a.k.a. McCoy, a.k.a. EMAC, from the University of California, Irvine, Department of Emergency Medicine. If you have any questions, I am physically here at conference right now lecturing in a different room, but I'll conclude that lecture at 2.30 p.m. at room 402A. Thanks again, and have a great experience at IMSH 2018. Three, two, go!